Hi, you're watching Teen Kids News. I'm Reed. Let's begin with our top story. Let's face it, from poverty to pollution, our world is facing some pretty big challenges. Solutions are needed to deal with them. There's one group that may have answers, yet it's often overlooked. That group is us teens. But there's an organization working to change that. The Global Collab runs an annual contest called the Teens Dream Video Challenge. Before I tell you more about the Global Collab's video challenge, I need to first explain STGs. Back in 2015, the United Nations came up with what they called a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. To accomplish that, the UN identified 17 STGs, Sustainable Development Goals. For example, goal one is end poverty, goal two is zero hunger, goal three is good health and well-being, and so on. So, the Global Collab invited teens around the world to submit videos that offer ways to reach these goals. Ten winners were chosen. One of them is Rania as a Nekwe from Colorado. Rania, you chose to tackle goal number 15, life on land. What is that exactly? Well, life on land basically deals with the Earth's natural environment and the biodiversity that occupies it. This can range from natural ecosystems such as the savannas, grasslands, and um, farmlands to urban landscapes and rural landscapes as well. So it basically deals with all life that occupies land and how we can promote a more sustainable future regarding that life on land. You specifically focused on desertification, which essentially means land that can grow crops, known as arable land, is turning into desert. Let's take a look at an excerpt from your video. 75% of global desertification is caused by overcultivation. Why? Well, to keep up with rapid population growth in developing countries, global crop yields must increase by 70% by 2050. To do so, farmers employ intensive cultivation methods that deteriorate soils, deplete freshwater resources, and contribute to desertification. So, how can we resolve this crisis while safely maximizing crop yields? Good question! And you actually came up with a possible solution. Yes, and my solution actually involves weeds. I know, those pesky little plants that just keep popping up in your garden, and no matter how many times you try to remove them, they just won't stop coming back. So why weeds? Well, weeds are quite similar to normal plants, like basil, flowers, oregano, and all other plants that you grow in a normal garden, because they contain essential organic compounds, organic nutrients, and nutrients that are necessary for life on land. So how does it work? Well, firstly, we need farmers to actually take these weeds and replant them in desertified areas. And when farmers plant these weeds in those areas, the weeds actually provide nutrients to the soil because they rapidly grow and they also thrive in depleted soils, meaning that they can provide nutrients to the soil without taking much in. And when they do remove them, the soil is completely enriched as the weeds have provided essential nutrients to the soil so that when farmers go to plant the crops that they actually want, the crops can grow and thrive in those newly restored soils. That's awesome. And no one before you ever thought of using weeds this way? Maybe someone has thought of it, but I guess I was the first one to actually implement it, research it, and publicize it on this widespread scale. Very cool. What gave you the idea to turn useless weeds into useful fertilizer? Well, I just looked into my backyard, basically. My backyard has mm, many weeds in it, unfortunately, especially my garden area. So I was just doing a little bit of thinking, and I thought, well, what differentiates a weed from a plant? Basically, not very much besides how fast they grow and what humans think of them. So I basically just thought that, hmm, maybe we can repurpose these weeds in very beneficial ways that could benefit everybody. What a great idea. You even developed a kit to promote sustainability. Yes, and my sustainability kit is actually called Grow Your Own Garden, or G-Y-O-G for short. Many people, especially in urban areas, in areas that are in the, in the central cities, don't really have very much access to gardens like I do in a suburban neighborhood. 
So I thought, why don't we just bring that garden size and shrink it down a little bit? We could make mini garden kits that we could distribute to people who are in low income areas or very congested areas like cities and make agriculture more attainable to them. Gotta say, you have an impressively fertile mind. Good luck with all your initiatives. Thank you so much. Goodbye. The time to start finding solutions to the most pressing global problems is now. That's because the UN is hoping to achieve the 17th Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And that's where the CoLab comes in. They believe that teens globally are an underutilized resource, so they offer training and networking to empower teens. If you want to be an agent of change, check out the next video challenge at teensdreamcolab.org. The world needs you. I'm Alexandra for Teen Kids News. We still have a lot more to tell you about. Teen Kids News will be right back. There's a saying that one person's trash is another person's treasure. As we're about to see, in the world of design, that can be very true. My name is Guilherme. I went to SVA for graphic design. SVA stands for New York's School of Visual Arts. In addition to teaching art and design, SVA prides itself on social responsibility and innovation. And that brings us to a rather innovative project. Art History 101, A Brush with Fashion, is based on the concept of dresses designed in the likes of particular art movements. But wait, there's more. After the dresses were created, they were put on display along one of America's most fashionable streets, Madison Avenue. It also gives an opportunity for students here at the School of Visual Arts to showcase their work on Madison Avenue. That's a great opportunity for them, and I think it's a great experience for everyone who comes here. And that brings us back to Guilherme and the dress he designed. My piece is based off the Italian Povera movement. I made a dress out of found objects and trash. Yes, you heard correctly. He basically used garbage to make his dress. Arte Povera means poor art in Italian. It was an art movement that started in the late 1960s. Like many other things in the 60s, Arte Povera was a form of protest against those in power, the so-called establishment. Guilherme chose to create his dress in this art form, not because he was rebelling, but because he liked to collect things as a kid. My inspiration is my upbringing. I always needed to find objects to make my art. And people on the street seemed to find his art, as well as the art of his classmates, intriguing. Look at the traffic column. Isn't that unique? Yeah, I like the that. Yeah, it's awesome. I don't go a day on Madison Avenue without seeing somebody stop me, smiling, taking a picture, putting it on their Instagram feed, something about the wonderful pieces that are here on the street. Because it, it's something that you don't expect, and something when you see puts a real smile on your face. This is the best thing that ever happened to Madison Avenue. These designers should be in these shops. I always liked the process of making things, and I found out that in art, the process of making something is design. The designer who created the iconic logo, I Heart New York, said that there are three responses people can make about a design. Yes, no, and wow. Wow is the one to aim for. The 21 dresses on display along Madison Avenue no doubt got a whole lot of wows. For Teen Kids News, I'm Katerina. If you're intending to visit America's second most popular national park, the Grand Canyon, there's one particular animal you'll need to be especially careful of. Is it the bighorn sheep? No. Is it North America's largest land animal, the bison? It is not. How about the fearsome mountain lion? Nope. Mountain lions don't see humans as prey, so they avoid us as much as possible. The most dangerous animal in the park is actually the rock squirrel. Every year, visitors try to feed this cute little creature, and every year, dozens of visitors get bitten by the furry fiend. So have a great time taking in the awesome sights at the Grand Canyon, but remember the basic rule. Never feed nor even approach any of the animals, and hopefully, they'll return the favor. 
For Teen Kids News, I'm Reese. We've got to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more Teen Kids News. There's an entire history lesson in a state flag. You just need to know what to look for. Virginia is often called the mother of presidents. Four of our first five presidents were born there. Since then, four more presidents have been proud Virginians. Virginia's state flag is a reference to overthrowing King George. You see the Roman goddess Virtus standing atop a tyrant, and she's holding a sword in one hand, a spear in the other, and the tyrant is laying on the ground with his crown knocked off of his head. It's hard to see, but the tyrant holds a broken chain and a broken whip. Six Semper Tyrannus means thus always to tyrants. With Flag Facts, I'm Eric. What are the five smartest animals? Well, that depends on who you ask. That's because there seems to be a lot of disagreement among scientists. Here's one list. In fifth place, the crow. Next is the elephant. Then the orangutan, the dolphin, and the brainiest beast, the chimpanzee. If you're a dog lover, sorry. Our best friend doesn't even make it into the top 10. But let's face it, what would you rather cuddle? A dog or a crow? For Teen Kids News, I'm Camille. Safe driving takes a clear head, a steady hand, and good reactions. Unfortunately, you don't have any of those if you're driving impaired. To drive that message home, Here's a video from the National Road Safety Foundation. License registration, please. I, uh, I, I know they're here somewhere. Well, I stopped you because you were swerving in and out of your lane. For real? For real. Have you been drinking tonight, sir? Uh, no, no, sir. No, those aren't mine. Well, you look pretty camera to me, sir. Step out of the vehicle, please. Man, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. Drive hammered, get nailed. It's time for a quick commercial break, but we'll be right back with more Teen Kids news, so don't go away. He's probably the first superstar of sports. Although born with the name George, he was better known to fans as the Sultan of Swat or the Bambino, or more simply as just Babe. Scott has the report. He was, um, you know, the biggest star in baseball. He was the biggest star in New York. He kind of was the emblem for the Roaring Twenties of America. The whole country embraced him for the, the exuberance with which he lived, the dynamic, the spirit that he had. Babe Ruth was big news back in the early days of baseball, and not just on the field. He was in movies, in comic books. There was even Babe Ruth underwear. A candy bar believed to be named after him is still popular today, the Baby Ruth. These are just some of the fascinating exhibits you'll see here at the Babe Ruth Birthplace Museum. This is the actual building where the babe was born. Thousands of visitors from all around the world come every year because uh, Ruth is not just important to America, but he is important to the game of baseball wherever it's played. He established all of the slugging records in baseball. Back uh, when he was coming on as a home run hitter, he would uh, frequently out-homer um, what entire teams were able to put up in a single year. And he also was an all-star caliber pitcher, so there is no other player in history who has ever done that. It's thrilling to get a glimpse into not just the Babe's professional career, but his personal life as well. And this is Babe Ruth's grandparents' bedroom. And uh, Babe's mother came up here and gave birth to Babe, but also to seven other kids. Because back in 1895, and at that time frame, that's what Americans did. They gave birth at home. Don't let the dainty room and baby picture fool you. George Herman Ruth was born into a gritty life. His parents ran a saloon, and young George ran kind of wild. When he was just seven, his parents were forced to send him to a school for problem kids. The state was threatening them and saying, we're going to make him a ward of the state, take him away from you. So they put him in St. Mary's, which was run by um, a group of, of Catholic brothers. And it, uh, it was known for discipline. Uh, you get a little bit of an education as well. Fortunately, 
St. Mary's also was known for its baseball team. This is Babe Ruth's catcher's mitt from St. Mary's Industrial School. He was scouted for the Orioles, a minor league team back then. Here's his rookie baseball card, now worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. The guy next to him is Jack Dunn, the owner of the Baltimore Orioles. George was so young that in order to hire him, Dunn had to become George's legal guardian. They go to spring training and the Baltimore Sun starts referring to George Ruth as Jack Dunn's baby. And by May of that year, it had been shortened to Babe Ruth. Soon, fans could tune into radio broadcasts of the Babe pitching for the Boston Red Sox. But he was even more valuable as a slugger. He moved on to the championship Yankees and stardom. But he always made time for his fans, especially young ones. There are many stories about uh, the babe coming home from Yankee Stadium after a game and he would stop the car if he saw a game of a ball going on and get out and play with the kids because he just he just was like that. Babe Ruth had a heart as big as Yankee Stadium. Mike told me the story of Babe's promise to a kid dying of a rare disease. It was a promise that seems to have helped save the young fan's life. Over here you see a bunch of baseballs all signed by Babe Ruth but the one second in from the left is uh, the ball that Babe Ruth signed and he made the prediction that he would hit a homer for little Johnny Sylvester in the uh, 1926 World Series and this is the ball where he writes the prediction. On the side of the ball he writes I'll, hit, I'll knock a homer in Wednesday's game for you and he hit three and the boy listens to the game on the radio and he gets better. In the 1932 World Series Ruth hit one of the most famous home runs in history, the called shot. The Yankees were playing in Chicago. The Cub fans and even the players were booing the Bambino. I remember they get it was a tough series. Both clubs riding each other, doing everything to get each other's go. Well, how did this one? After two strikes, Ruth says he wanted to send a message. And at that point, he points. You can barely see him pointing in this picture from a spectator. Legend has it. He was showing just where he was going to send the ball. But nevertheless, the next pitch comes in. It is low and away, and Ruth goes down and gets it and hits the longest home run in the history of Wrigley Field. Some people don't believe he was really calling the shot. They claim he was pointing at something else. But Ruth would always say he pointed to the American flag, and that's where he hit the home run. Do you think he called the shot? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he called it. He is telling everybody that something big is going to happen, and it did. For Teen Kids News, I'm Scott. We'll have more Teen Kids News right after this. It's been said that dogs are our best friends. But sometimes we make the mistake of thinking a dog is friendly when it's really not. Eden tells us more. So you're walking down the street and you come across a dog. It's wagging its tail so you'd think he's happy to see you. But when you reach out to pet him, he suddenly turns mean. What happened? To find out, we have Robin Bennett and Susan Briggs. They call themselves the dog gurus. They're also the author of the book Off Leash Dog Play. Welcome. Thanks, we're happy to be here. It's great to be here with you today. So Susan, we can't assume that a wagging tail is always a good sign, can we? No, you can't. We love our dogs and they communicate a lot to us. And the tail is an important part of that, but just because it's wagging its tail doesn't mean it's friendly and you should approach it. Do you have to worry about speed or where they're holding their tail? Yes, you look at whether they're, what position is the tail, whether they're holding it high or low, and you look at how fast that wag is. Robin, can you give us some specific examples? Well, sure. Let's say you're going to pet that dog and he ends up be turning mean. You might have noticed the dog's tail was wagging, but he might have been protecting his owner. So that tail wag might have been way up over his back, really high, because that's a really good sign that the dog is protecting something. Or maybe you have a dog that's afraid of something and he's hiding. You'll find that those tail wags are going to be really low, tucked under the body, but still wagging. But that's still a dog I wouldn't really want to pet right at that moment. Susan, besides the tail, are there other signs we should be looking for? Yes, we actually recommend we look at the other end. So let's look at the mouth. A dog that's safe to approach generally has an open mouth. A closed mouth means that a dog's starting to get uncomfortable. You can also look at their body. Is their 
Are their muscles relaxed? Is it kind of curve and loose? Versus a dog that you wouldn't want to approach would be very stiff. Those dogs are uncomfortable and it's not safe. But I guess the bottom line is, if you don't know the dog, don't approach him unless his owner says it's okay. Yes, you want to first ask the owner, and if the owner says yes, still check in with the dog to see what the dog's body language is telling you. Is the mouth open? Is the body posture relaxed? So really we would say three steps. Number one, ask the owner. Number two, ask the dog. And number three, pet the dog if both of them say it's okay. I certainly learned a lot. Thank you both very much. You're welcome, thanks. It was great. So the next time you hear someone say that a wagging tail means the dog is friendly, you can tell them that's just an old wives tale. And you learn that here on Teen Kids News. That's it for this edition of Teen Kids News. Thanks for watching. See you again next week.